spending time trying to figure out, all right, well, I think it's going to be inflation and the Fed's going to pivot and then that's going to happen. I just think it's a complete waste of mental energy right now. I'd rather sit there and think, okay, what can hurt me? What can hurt me if it happens right now? Is it the return of deflation? Is it continued inflation? What's my weak point? And how do I try and prepare to be less wrong when that happens? Welcome to Wealthion. I'm Wealthion founder Adam Taggart. Thanks for joining us for part two of our interview with macro analyst Grant Williams. If you haven't yet watched part one of our discussion with Grant, in which he explains why switching from passive to active management will be the key to wealth preservation and growth from here, head over to our channel at youtube.com slash Wealthion and watch it there first. It sets the context for the investment themes we discuss in this video. All right, let's get started watching part two of our interview with Grant Williams. All right, well, look, in, in kind of beginning to wrap this up here, um, I want to get to sort of the, the type of future that you're preparing for, right? Because you said that as an investor, that's one of the things that you need to be doing right now, right? Is is first getting your 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 primary plan straight, right? And I would say I'm painting with a broad brush here, <laughs> but with the majority, if I look at the consensus of the folks that I've been interviewing recently, I'd probably synthesize it into a um, the most probable path that the consensus opinion seems to to project right now is we'll have some sort of rally or or, or you know th th things will will hang in there in the first half of this year. Um, China opening markets still you know divorced from the data, you know whatever that'll last for some period of time. Um, the, the China reopening surge will kind of moderate at some point, and then the data will, will probably start to win out over the market hopium. And, and, and then potentially that's when, you know, recession hits. And we haven't even talked about the, the lag effect from the 450 yeah. basis point of hikes that have already been done, uh, hitting in full force, right? Cause it takes them a while to manifest in the real economy, right? So it's sort of like, okay, things will hang in there for, for the first half of the year. They'll probably start to go off the rails at some point in the second half of the year. And then at some point, lo and behold, the Fed probably will be forced to pivot by some systemic crisis somewhere. And then we're going to see like a big central bank rescue. There'll be a policy reversal. There'll be lots of stimulus again and whatnot. Um, just love your reaction to that. Is that is that does that mesh with the consensus of what you're hearing? Do you think that there is another outcome that has a higher probability standpoint? And again, this is all going to change as we get more data. Sure. I'm smiling because I, let, let's say you're absolutely right. Let's say that is what happens. What are you going to do with that information? What are you going to do with that roadmap you've just laid out? Are you going to try and time all those swings? Because even if you're right about the path it all takes. If you're going to make money out of that, you've got to get every single one of those turns. You've got to position yourself for the first bit, get the turn, position yourself for the next bit, get the turn. It's so complicated. And there's, there's not one man in a thousand or one woman in a thousand that has the ability to get that right. So you're trying to thread an incredible needle without this backdrop of a rising tide that you know is going to push everything higher ultimately. So if you're wrong, you may just have to wait and everything's going to float higher over time, right? So if you get, a, so spending a whole lot of time thinking, okay, here's what I think. And I, you know, my, my dear friend, Felix Zulav, I talked with him um, at the tail end of last year and he is as brilliant a man as there is at doing this stuff, at figuring Agreed. out how things are going to change. He's, he's, he's extraordinarily good at it. Um, and talking to Felix off mic about how difficult it is makes you realize if he thinks it's difficult, I'm not even going to try exactly right? because I, I don't have Felix's chops. If I if I had Felix's chops, you know, I'd be living on my own island somewhere, right? So, spending time trying to figure out, all right, well, I think it's going to be inflation, and the Fed's going to pivot, and then that's going to happen. I just think it's a complete waste of mental energy right now. I'd rather sit there and think, okay, what can hurt me? What can hurt me if it happens right now? Is it the return of deflation? Is it continued inflation? What's my weak point and how do I try and prepare to be less wrong when that happens? You know, my friend James Aitken, uh, who again, I spent four hours interviewing in London recently, um, 
you know, just a brilliant, brilliant thinker. And James has pointed to me the whole way through. It was, look, I'm, I spend my life trying to be less wrong. Every day I try to be less wrong. Mm-hmm. And it's, it's such a great, way, a great to way to think about it, right? So I think the path you've laid out is entirely plausible. I absolutely could see that's how things could go. And I don't know if there's a consensus. I don't think I talk to enough people to know what consensus is, but I've certainly heard that pathway posited by an awful lot of smart people. I just don't know what the hell I'm going to do with that information because I'm not going to sit there and try and time all those. Because every single point you transition to was a complete pivot in the narrative. It's a complete about face. It's not, we're going to go up and then this is going to happen. It's going to push us higher. And then that's going to happen. It's going to push us a little bit higher. And then we're going to hit the top and go down. It's this is going to happen. And then it's going to turn. And then this is going to happen. It's going to come back in. And I'm just not going to spend the time trying to trade all that. I just, I just think it's, it's a mugs game. And I know I'm not capable of doing that effectively like Felix can. So I'm not going to try because I, I think we've all been tricked over the last summer of years to think we're all brilliant traders. We're not, you know, Rick Rule says all the time, don't confuse brains with the bull market. And he's absolutely right. Yep. So we've had a bull market in just about everything. It's over. And do, do we start another one? Maybe. And if I see signs that it's in a bull market, great. It gets much easier again. It's right. We've got a bull market. Things are going to go up so I can buy them. I can own them. And there might be some periods where I'm down, but the tide is higher. We just can't say that now. So I, I just, you know, I, it's, it's a weak answer to your question. But with all that as consensus, I just have no idea what to do with that information. Well, so it, but this, this dialogue is instructive, right? Because there are a lot of people, and I would put myself in this camp too, which if they think, okay, that, that, that may be my default projection of what's going on, then I got to ask myself, at least in the first part of it, do I want to participate in that? Or is that more like, picking up nickels in front of the steamroller, right? Am, am, am I better if I think there's good odds of recession coming this year with earnings compression and stock prices coming down and all that type of stuff? Do I just get super defensive? And and yeah, maybe I miss a little you know, rally here at the beginning, but I'm not wiped out, right? If my default scenario hits. Right. Look, you, look you, you, we love those sports analogies, right? So you're basically standing at the plate and there's a guy throwing 95 mile an hour knuckle the ball day. You, you want to swing at all those or do you want to wait till his arm gets tired and you get some guy that throws, you know, a right. fastball straight down the middle of the plate and swing at that? Because that's that's the way I'm thinking about this. I don't want to try and hit all these really difficult pitches because if I'm wrong and there's a high chance that I'll be wrong, even if I'm not wrong in direction, I'm wrong in timing, this is just infinitely harder. So I'd rather as I say, think what can hurt me, try and mitigate that as best I can, and then wait for a signal that, okay, I can see things lining up that there is, there is a tailwind again. There is a reason for things to, to move higher over time, not just for the next X amount of months. And then I've got to get out at the right time and get in at the right time. When it's, I just, I, you know, like I said, I, I just, I don't know, unless you give me the exact days when those turns are going to happen, I don't know what to do with that information because yeah. I mean, just think of the torment of trying to trade five swings that you just described to me, get them all right, and come out the other side, you know, fabulously wealthy. I mean, like I said, you you got rich the last ten years. You've been in markets. Just don't give it. Don't give it away. That would be that would be crazy. So somebody for whom your thinking is resonating, and and you know, showing my hands. Of course, it resonates with me. But um, okay, so you can sit in cash. Right, you can sit parked in cash, right? Um, you, as you said earlier, you can actually be parked in instruments that now pay you a return to kind of wait, right? And, and mostly, I'm thinking about right. you know treasury bonds, there, sovereigns. Hey, um, your treasury looks really pretty good right now, you know. It just does. I, I, I I've talked about this before, but I, I I did a presentation in 2000. I want to say 11, maybe it was 12. And I put up a chart that had two bars on it. And it was the interest on $10 million parked in two-year treasuries in 2007 before the, the global financial crisis and where we were in 2011 after the response to it. And you had $10 million. You put it in two-year treasuries in 2007. You earned half a million dollars interest. So there you go. Your capital's safe. You've got a yeah. very nice lifestyle, zero risk. 
in 2011 or 12, whenever I did this presentation, you were earning $13,000 on that same $10 million, right? So there was no risk-free return. You couldn't, you couldn't, you had to invest your capital to, to right. stand still. Which was the great evil of QE, I think, where it just yeah, no, forced absolutely people was. out on the risk and, curve. Yeah. Yeah. And the people I talked to had spent their lifetimes saving up $10 million so they could retire and, and they and they couldn't do it. You know, it, it was it was heartbreaking. But now we're back to those kinds of levels. We're back to four and a half, five percent. So you get four hundred thousand dollars, let's say that's four percent on a two-year treasury. You can earn four hundred thousand dollars of income if you've got that ten million dollars. And obviously, you can. I mean, I just picked that number um, out of the top of my head. But whatever it is, whatever you've saved up, you can earn a half decent return. And look, yes, it's not going to completely match inflation. But assuming you're not spending all of your income, your, your life, you know, there is there is a, a buffer between what your outgoings are um, and your income, which which hopefully most people have managed to, to solve for that problem. It's going to take away a lot of that inflationary pain in the short term until you get a sense of, okay, now we know how all those questions, all those swings that you talk about, now we know how they've resolved themselves. What do I do now? But before, if you were earning thirteen thousand dollars on ten million, or you know, uh, thirteen hundred on a million, you didn't have that choice to just say, "Okay, I'm going to be patient here. I'm going to be patient, wait for that fat pitch." All right, great point. Um, and Lance, uh, Lance Grant, there's one last topic I want to I want to close with sure. you on. And real quick before I get to that, though, just to close out this one, um, you know, in the past you have been, I would say, uh, a fan of hard assets in general. And given that it sounds like your default concern here is more on the inflation side, um, are, are you still are, are you still a proponent of owning some hard assets? And, and I'm guessing maybe you might be less as a, oh, because I think they're going to just vault higher in price, but almost more as just a, a capital preservation tool or purchasing power preservation yeah. tool, right? Yeah. Look, I mean, I've, I've never owned hard assets, uh, particularly precious metals, thinking they were going to go higher in price ever. It's never been my reason for holding them. It's always been capital preservation and purchasing power protection. That's it, period. Um, and so I've I've held precious metals for, I don't know, almost 20 years now, I guess. Uh, yeah, maybe a little over 20 years. Um, I've never sold any. At times, I've had a bigger allocation to them. You know, I might, I might my, my, my bullion I've never sold. I may have had some allocations at mining stocks at various periods of time and, and cut those and, and been down or, or maybe, you know, made some money and not reinvested into precious metals to keep that percentage the same. But right now uh, I've got a significant um, allocation to precious metals because they, they do the things that I've just talked about that I'm worried about, right? How do I protect my purchasing? How do I protect my portfolio? Um, I think they do that very, very well. And so, you know, for me, having treasuries right now makes sense. Having gold makes sense. Having cash makes sense because, yes, even though it's getting eaten away by inflation, um, you know, I, I don't think I'm going to be owning it for 10 years and it's going to get destroyed. I think I maybe own it for a year and there's an opportunity to, to put it to work somewhere else at, at, at you know, sensible prices. Um, but I'm, I'm very defensive, you know. I'm very defensive right now. And, and from this whole thought process that we've talked about, what can hurt me? You know, um, being fully invested in risk assets and being wrong can really hurt me right now, because I think that without that tide we've talked about underneath that undercurrent of rising prices um, in asset markets, if I'm wrong, it could be really expensive. And I, and I just I don't want to take that chance. I've been I've been very fortunate in these last few years that thanks to uh, stimulus and thanks to all these other things, the stuff I've owned has just gently floated higher in in troublesome times. Um, and I'm grateful for that, but I'm not going to assume that's going to continue. Great. Um, one thing we haven't talked about and we don't have time to do it justice is currency risk. And um, just because we're talking about precious metals here, um, I noticed on your Twitter feed that you had linked to an article recently that um, Lebanon devalued its currency by 90% yeah. uh, earlier this month. And we got a lot of viewers that are international. I, I don't necessarily lie awake at night thinking that the US dollar is going to devalue by 90% tomorrow, probably not the euro either. But um, it, this 
this example just shows that this still can happen, right? <laughs> and sure, and so sure. uh, if you're if you're in a country where you have some concerns about uh, the currency, especially if the dollar strengthens again this year, or just if your current your your, your country is sort of on the ropes, um, you know, again, hard assets provide good shelter there. Not enough time to do that that topic. Justice. No, but mo- but most of those countries. You'll if you go over, you'll find most people do own hard assets because they've faced that risk for a considerable period of time. And so it's it's in the in places like the West where we haven't had a devaluation, for, you know, in in America since you know, not a one-off one since '71, really. Um, so we haven't had to face that. So there, there's low precious metals ownership. But Lebanon, I guarantee you, there are a lot of people in Lebanon that had gold for just this reason. Turkey's the same. Um, you know, people understand that owning gold to to as part of their savings will work in in times of devaluation all right um well look last question before we we wrap things up here grant um which is um uh you know like i said you're you're the gold standard in my eye for these long form macro discussions um and uh, i've i've been sharing uh, on this program the 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 growth that wealthy has seen as a channel um, which has surprised nobody more th- than it su- surprised me in terms of, of, of how quickly it's grown since we launched it a year and a half ago. And, and I, I really do believe a big part of that is, yes, we try to put out the best product we can, but it, it's that people are increasingly dissatisfied and frustrated with conventional media, particularly around um, topics of money, finance, investing, uh, and are out there um, searching you know, for something that's more nutritious, more, more, more valuable for them and actually giving them insights that, that they can practically put into action in their own lives. Um, and so two questions for you on this. Um, one, as one of the torchbearers of sort of the new media movement in this space, what do you see as like our responsibility as content producers to, to meet the, the, the needs of these people that are being unmet by traditional media? Look, I think I think it's really, really simple, Adam. To be honest, for me, it's just been about just be honest about the content. You know, don't 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 cater to anybody's agenda. Don't give people what you think they either want to hear, which is a, a trick that a lot of people fall into because they want to build a big audience. You know, the size of the audience becomes the most important thing, and so they create content that they think will attract the biggest audience. You know, that that to me is a cardinal sin. But if you just put honest content out there, you know, if you're trying to do a service or provide a service to people and help them, just be honest about the content. Just talk about things you care about. Talk about things you're passionate about. Uh, be be willing to say I don't know. Uh, listen more than you talk. I mean, it, it, it's it, for me, it's just it's just common sense values that are rooted in the content first, and not okay. What is what does having a successful content business bring me? What, what, what audience do I need to get to attract great advertisers who pay me a lot of money in, in sponsorship fees? If, if you come at it from that side, look, you might be successful in the short term and build a big audience. But if you, if you forget about the size of the audience, say, look, the, the content I put out, every single piece I put out is going to have integrity, then ultimately people will realize that and they'll understand that and it will have genuine value to them that there that there is an integrity and a substance to the content you put out and it's not a means to an end it's not a means to a business it's not a means to income it's not a means to um to uh to to grow an audience right it it is here's what i do and there is there is substance to it there's there's integrity to it and if it resonates with you great and if you can accidentally as i've done make a business out of that accidentally then that's the best thing in the world. Uh, if if what you provide doesn't have value or changes because you're trying to tweak your metrics and work out, okay, if I if I do this, if I make my content shorter or noisier or louder, the the algorithm says I'll get ten percent more subscribers. I, I just I, I don't know what to say. I think the content has to come first, and it has to come from the heart, and it has to have purpose. And it has to have integrity. That that's it. And I think your business will right size itself to the audience that values that. And it might not be the the biggest audience or the size that you want the audience to be, but you'll know that you have an audience to whom you're providing a meaningful service. And that to me is far more important than trying to get the biggest number of eyeballs I can. 
Well, that's a, that's a great answer. And I've been waiting to ask that to, to have you on to ask that question, because I, I can't ask that of too many of the guests on this program. You know, they're, <laughs> they're, 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 they're talking heads, they're experts, but they don't, they're not in the business that you and I are in. Um, and I think that was a great answer. Um, you know, the, I think what frustrates a lot of people about mainstream channels is, is, is uh, they tend to start from a, with an agenda. There's a bias. Um, yeah that they sure. bring to the story, the coverage, and oftentimes it's highly influenced by the, their advertisers, by their sponsors, right? You know, what yes. I hear about people with CNBC, it's just like, no matter what they're talking about, the answer is always going to be buy more stocks today, right? <laughs> because okay. they have a bunch of huge ETF advertisers. Um, and, and at least what I hear from folks, you know, is that echoes very well what you said is it's, you know, it's got to be informative. It's got to be unbiased. Um, it's got to be, you know, actionable. Uh, and it's got to talk about, you know, the, the well, real well, things. Let's that talk about that because that, that's my big bugbear. This idea that everything has to be actionable, right? Because what what's happened is this idea actionable, this word actionable. You know, everything's actionable. If you sit and think about it for a period of time, it's all actionable. You can There's something you can do with information if it's good information. But actionable has become this word that people substitute for i need to be able to type in a three letter ticker and do something and buy something or sell something based on this actionable give me a trade give me something to physically do um and that's why i said to you at the beginning of this right there are plenty of people out there that will that will give you tickers all day long you buy this buy this buy this it's going up it's great i've done all the research it's going up. buy it it's great there's a there's a there's a thousands and thousands of those guys out there and some of them are very good and some of them are very bad and it's up to you to figure out which are which and You'll probably do that the hard way, but you'll figure it out, and that's fine. But you know what, to me, is actionable is, for example, the four hours I spent talking to James Aitken. He didn't, we didn't talk about a single stock. We talked about the lessons he's learned throughout his career and how he thinks and how he, how he processes information and comes up with his own ideas. That's incredibly actionable if you're willing to sit and spend the time to listen and spend the time to sit and think about it and work out, okay, what is the actionable advice here? You know what? It's to read more. It's not a stock ticker. It's, it's, to, it's, to, it's to talk to more people. It's to not um, do the first thing you think of when you, when you hear a story about this, or it's to read past Bank of Japan. It's all actionable. But I, I really, and I'm sorry to be on a soapbox, but... I hear this word all the time and the meaning of it has just been so kidnapped by I need a trade idea at the end of it. And it drives me out of my mind. It really does. I, I was so glad you jumped up on this pedestal because um, to, to, to me, <laughs> sorry, it's I not... didn't mean to do that. That's, that's no, out no, of no, character. No, 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 you no, just, good though, you but, pushed but, my button. Well done. Yeah, no, no, it's, but it's good. But so it, it's not to drive to a decision necessarily. It, it's to improve your decision making, right? So like a, a, a large part of the key takeaway for many people from this, this conversation may be, hey, I, I might not need to do anything for a while, right? right? Like maybe the right thing to do right now is is a nothing, at least until I have you know greater clarity. And then yeah. Grant gave me three things to think about more so that... Um, you know, when I see certain indicators, then maybe I'll feel like I'll be able to make a decision then, right? So I 1000% I agree with what you're you're saying here. And Grant, I'd love to keep digging into this. Uh, I, I'm, I'm realizing we're now way out of time. Well, last quick question on this 20 second answer. You talk to a lot of great people, you interact with a lot of great people in the media space. Are there any voices right now? Like I know Doomberg is a new entrant in here, and it's a mutual friend of ours. Are there any voices out there right now, whether they are little known or well known, that you think are are really worth paying attention to, given the current environment that we're in? No, I mean, I, I've, I'm fortunate to collaborate with some really smart people on my podcast series, and so you know, for sure, those guys, you know, uh, Bill Fleckenstein, um, you know, at Fleck Cap on on Twitter, Steph Pomboy, our mutual friend, is just an absolute genius, um, and far too modest for her own good. Doomberg, as you said, agreed, um, fantastic. Uh, ben Hunt, I could listen to Ben all day long. He's just he's just so smart. And I know he's a polarizing figure, but he's absolutely brilliant. He's one of the nicest human beings you'll ever meet. Um, you know, Luke Groman, with all the stuff going on in in with the end of the petrodollar and all this uh, bipolar world that we're moving into, Luke's work has never been more important. You know, at Luke Groman on Twitter, um, at Steph Pomboy, at Doomberg T for the other ones. And you know, a good friend of mine is just um launching his own service called The Mad King. Um, and his uh, his Twitter handle, I've got to get this right, is 
at the King Court. Um, and he's worth a follow. He's a really smart guy. He's doing his stuff like Doomberg anonymously, but he's just launching his his service. And um, uh, he shared his first few pieces with my readers and it's exceptional work. And so I think he, he'll be someone that uh, will be a really good follower that very few people know about right now. So you, you can have that one for free. All right. <laughs> Thanks. Well, that's great. You just gave people a lot of good names to go out uh, and to, um, to, if they don't, if they haven't heard them before, to give them a listen and see what they think. Um, all right. Well, look, Grant's, uh, Grant, the, the, the most important uh, one of those obviously is for folks that have really enjoyed this conversation, um, probably very few, but maybe some of them, this is the first time they've really heard you speak at length. Where should they go to follow you and your work in the future? I, I can't wait to hear that edit back, Adam, because it's going to sound fantastic. All the people who enjoyed this conversation, probably very few. It's going to sound really great when you play that back. Um, <laughs> I mean, probably oh, look, very few you, have not heard it's, of you, it's really, yes. I know, I know, I know. I'm only pulling your leg. It's, it's very simple. Grant-Williams.com. Everything's on there that you need to know if you need to know anything. Um, and my Twitter handle is at T-T-M-Y-G-H, which is the acronym for things that make you go, hmm, that's it. doesn't get any more complicated than that. All right. Well, Grant, I, I, I absolutely know that people now know why you were one of my absolute favorite people to interview. Thanks for coming back on. Thanks for giving us so much of your time. It's just been a pleasure as always, my friend. Well, thank you for having me, my friend. And uh, best of luck. I'm really enjoying watching uh, Wealthy and Go from Strength to Strength. So congratulations on that and, and keep at it. Thanks, brother. All right. Well, now is the time in the program where we bring in the lead partners from New Harbor Financial, one of the financial advisory firms endorsed by Wealthion. Uh, normally, I'm joined by both lead partners, John Lodra and Mike Preston. John is away this week, so Mike will be carrying the water of two men. Um, Mike, love to hear your thoughts on uh, Grant's excellent uh, interview there. Um, obviously, I think, as I said, you guys owe him some sort of spiff uh, or some sort of uh, thank you basket for uh, setting up the ball so well for you guys in terms of really making the very eloquent argument of why active management is going to be so important going forward and just as important as the investments you pick for your portfolio, for most people, probably more important is going to be picking the right advisor who's got the right skill set and the right mindset for the type of investing environment that we're heading into. Um, so anyways, um, what were what were some of your biggest key takeaways from the discussion with Grant? Thanks, Adam. Got a lot of respect for Grant Williams and the work that he does. And I think he puts things very succinctly in, in, a, in a very straightforward way. You know, he says that Basically, he says that buy and hold strategy is probably done. A lot of people have made a lot of money over the last 10 years just by buying and holding the market or certainly by buying holding, buying and holding certain stocks, FANG stocks, for example. It didn't really take much other than just staying in it, which is difficult to do. Difficult to do because none of it made sense. It doesn't really make sense at all still. It's a very very dangerous, very con, uh, confusing market. Grant says that it's uh, probably one of the most confusing markets and it has more con conflicting signals, I think he said, than any other time he's seen in his career. I certainly agree that the macro environment is terrible, and yet it's all about the Fed. Even in this interview, um, most of the talk is about the Fed and what central banks are doing. And I don't I don't I don't blame him for that. Frankly, that's all anyone talks about for the most part because that's all that has mattered. And I believe we're we're entering a point where where data is going to matter more. I'm surprised that it's gone on this long without data mattering. But you have to convince yourself. Um I think that Grant said you you can't have conviction unless you're convinced that data doesn't matter. I think that's what he said. We think the data matters. It hasn't mattered for a long time, and we think it's going to matter soon. But um, buy and hold strategy is probably done. And he cites a lot of different things in his talk. He talks about um, Jeremy Grantham, and Jeremy Grantham thinks that at best we're going to have a flat environment in this market for a bunch of a bunch of years. I think that's probably the best case scenario that maybe the market could trade sideways and catch up to itself. More likely, the market will have a steep decline at some point when the realization phase sets in that there is no plan B, that it's only money printing and there is no other lever to which to go to. So the Fed really doesn't have any plan B. And even Jeremy Grantham has reiterated his call that we're in a super bubble. And he admits that he doesn't know the timing. He doesn't know the exact path, nor do we, but a decline of 50% or more from these levels wouldn't even get us back to undervalued. They might get us back to fair valuation. 
somewhere around 1800 or 2000 on the S&P is a level that you might expect 8 or 10% returns in the S&P 500 over the following 10 years. Right now, in my opinion, we're looking at negative returns. So there's so much else to go into here. Um, you know, one last point. You know, the Fed is going to be less able to do what they've been doing, what they've been getting away with for so long, because finally inflation is here. And it seems pretty persistent, even though we've seen inflation go from 9% or so down to about 6.4% as of yesterday's print. It seems like it's going to be more persistent. A lot of uh, speakers on your show have said that they think that we might normalize back towards 4% over the next year. We concur, but that's still persistent inflation. And I think there's a real risk that it could spike higher immediately if there's an idea that, you know, the Fed is going to print a lot more quickly. So I'll pause there for a moment, Adam. All right, Mike. Um, what's so interesting is you said that, you know, still this far into it all, all, all eyes are still on the Fed and what the Fed's going to do next. Um, and there's some data that came out this morning that I think is is potentially going to lend some, you know, visibility into what the Fed is going to do next, which is um, the retail sales numbers were just published. Uh, they had been pretty bad uh, coming into the end of last year, um, is one of the signs I've mentioned several times on this channel of, uh, you know, weakening economy, right? Um, well, the retail sales numbers just came out uh, for January, and they show a big rebound. Um, and, uh, you know, if you just look at the headlines, you might say, oh, hey, you know, well, economy is more resilient than folks thought, right? And uh, not saying that it, it may not be a sign of a green shoot somewhere. Um, but these are not, uh, these are not, uh, th sorry, the, 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 the biggest thing driving uh, the gain here in this number are seasonal adjust adjustments, uh, just like we saw with the recent jobs report, right, which was way better than anybody expected. Um, again, that was pretty much due to all sorts of seasonal adjustments being made there. And this retail sales data is not yet inflation adjusted. So if you actually adjust it for inflation, it's really not up by that much at all. So it's kind of a deceptive headline. Um, but of course, a lot of people that don't dig beneath the surface are going to take this as a, hey, this is a, a, a reason to support the bullish argument and to support the bullish rally that's been happening the first half of this year or the, the first month of this year in stocks. Um, but what's interesting in, in tying it back to the Fed here is if you're Jerome Powell and your job is to uh, destroy demand, right, which Powell has been saying for the past year is what he's laser focused on, that's going to be his mechanism by which he tames inflation. He has said, look, you know, what I got to do is I got to close this this gap between um, uh, job openings uh, and uh, workers who are available to work. Um, he says, you know, we've got way too many uh, job openings right now per worker, and we need to kind of right size that. And, and the translation of that is, is I need to cool off the jobs market. Right. Um, and then, you know, by doing that, he's going to be decreasing demand uh, for consumer purchases, which should be bringing com consumer purchases down. But if you look at the two recent reports we've had on job and on retail sales, well, you know, jobs are most gangbusters we've seen in, in forever, uh, and uh, we're not uh, at a record, all-time record low in unemployment, but we're pretty dang close to it. Uh, and now if you're looking at this unadjusted retail sales number, which appears, like I said, on first glance, very strong, um, <clears throat> you map that to the 6.4% inflation print from the other day you were just talking about there, Mike, which actually was a higher print than was expected. So you've got stubbornly high inflation. <laughs> you've got a jobs market that that is still like you know overheating, uh, and now you've got retail sales that seem to be rebounding here. So Powell doesn't want any of those three things right now, right? So in terms of you know kind of the higher for longer strategy that he's saying he's going to be pursuing and, and saying, guys, don't doubt me on this. He's got more more runway than he had before. Uh, to continue hiking rates here because he can point to all this data and saying, yeah, look, we haven't brought inflation down enough yet. Economy seems to be doing just fine. And the jobs market is still too hot. Right. So for those that have been expecting the Powell pivot to happen soon, I think those people are going to be disappointed. I think so, too. I mean, I think he's been pretty clear. He's tried to warn the mar the markets that uh, there could be more pain ahead. I, I, I guess I just have to interject and ask who asked 
the Fed to micromanage all of these things. You know, that's even the way we're talking. We're talking about the managing unemployment and managing you know, every little facet of the economy. They, they were never supposed to do that. They were, spo- they were supposed to be the lender of last resort in an emergency to inject emergency liquidity. And it's become so normalized that it's even normal for us to talk about the Fed and Chairman Powell, the, the, at least the current chairman, as really worrying about the minutiae of every little piece of data, which I've got no doubt that they do. They've got hundreds of economists on staff. But it just goes to show how far over the tips of the skis they may have gotten. And it's going to take some kind of accident or event, I think, for everyone to realize that. I don't think it's a good thing. I think it certainly has made markets less uh, free and has increased dramatically the chance of a sudden accident. So, um, but all of those things that you just said are true. I, I think that uh, Powell is going to be much more persistent in terms of his ability to, uh, or continuing to raise rates to give him some ability to have that button to go to in the future. But I think it's going to take a bit of a an elevator drop in markets, a bit of a crisis point for for us to get a real pivot. And looking at the charts, I believe that's down around 3,200 on the first major elevator move lower. And um, I think I think your recent guest, Sven Henrik, also had a number right around there. If it was 3,232, I think. Well, I call that close enough. Approximately 3,200 <laughs> is what it looks like to me. That's, in my opinion, the the, the minimum that you'd have to see to get a Fed pivot. And you might even have some overshoot to 2,800, 2,900, something like that. Just bear in mind, it's a very dangerous market when we have objectively data that shows we've never been more overvalued. We're probably overvalued by at least double compared to what normal valuations would be. And, and the only thing that the market has going for it is continued faith in central banking. Um, and, you know, like you said, there's there's inflation uh, coming in and, Retail sales are strong. Unemployment still low. Um, you know, all of all of these things give room for, for tightening action ahead. And the Fed tightened, I guess, a little over a year ago. They started, or roughly a year ago. And it takes about twelve months for these things to start to be seen in the real economy and in the markets. And we're right at that point now. And and furthermore, we're at a point where the market really has topped in November of twenty one. So going on fifteen months ago. This is a giant top in the market. Uh, it, it's potentially the largest top ever in terms of valuations and in terms of how spread out it has been. And now we've gone from a point last October, just a few months ago, where there was a lot of, uh, you might even say, excessive bearishness short term, to a point where there's very little worry. And I can tell you, just from anecdotally, from from you know the, the conversations that I have and the, and the people that I talk to, that there's a lot less worry now than there was a few a few months ago. So we're kind of back to overbought, over bullish, technicals not looking great. They're looking better, I'll give you that, but they're not looking great in some aspects. I think there's some real risk that we roll over and we and we make that move lower. And then maybe we could talk about a pivot. But here, I think it's absolutely pr- premature to think about it. Yeah, and you know, one thing that might, um be reducing the pivot odds as well is, um, you know, uh, we, we've, we've had some of the experts on the Fed talk in the past about how, um, uh, you know, there are a lot of doves on uh, the Fed Board of Governors um, and, uh, you know, it, it, the, the Fed tries to vote unanimously, but there are a lot of discussions that happen behind closed doors. And, and gosh, when was it? It was... Oh, gosh, it was at some point last year we had Danielle DiMartino Booth on and she was talking about kind of the Game of Thrones that, that had been going on um, and behind closed doors at the Fed, where um, you had a couple people making power plays to see if they could be jockeying to, you know, get Jerome Powell's chair, um, uh, you know, the next time the president decided uh, he wanted to appoint somebody and Lel Brainerd um, had been kind of at the top of that list. And she's historically been a really big dove. She's the vice chair of the Fed right now. Well, she just accepted a uh, position yesterday to head the National Economic Council, President Biden's National Economic Council, and that's going to require her to resign from the Fed. So even though the composition this year of the Fed board is still pretty dovish, um, one of the absolute biggest ones has just walked out the door. So that should help Powell a little bit in terms of if he wants to continue to hold resolute to the more hawkish, higher for longer program. 
um, it's one less person who might be trying to fight him on that. Um, I also want to just bring up a, a tweet here really briefly that um, uh, Alf Pecatiello, who's been on this program recently, put out there because it makes a good point. I um, I was asked yesterday to provide commentary about uh, my thoughts on the CPI, the recent CPI print. And um, I got a little bit of pushback on it because I, I raised the possibility that that Powell may be, the Fed may be over tightening at this point in time uh, because of the lag effect of, of you know, basically the most of the 450 basis points of rate hikes it's done so far haven't really fully hit the economy yet. And so, as we can tell from a lot of the macro data, the economy is slowing, struggling. Certainly, consumer households are having a tougher time. Corporations are beginning to lay people off at greater levels. As the, the delayed waves of those rate hikes continue to slam into the economy for the next couple of quarters, um, that is going to continue to slow economic growth. It's going to continue to bring demand down. And, you know, Powell has said, hey, I'm going to pause at some point because I want to see what that lag effect does to the economy. And, you know, maybe we've tightened enough, right? Well, he's going to keep tightening from here. He still has several more rate hikes ahead of him per what he's telling us. And there's a lot of people that think the economy can't withstand uh, a Fed funds rate above 5%. In fact, they think it might not be able to withstand a Fed funds rate over like three, three and a half percent, meaning we've already over tightened, right? So um, I raised the, the idea of perhaps the responsible thing to do would be to pause now, wait to see what the lag effect does to the economy. And if it's not enough, relatively straightforward to, to, to resume uh, tightening again. But the benefit of pausing now is that you've already tightened too much. You're not making it worse by doing continued rate hikes before you figure out that you tighten too much, right? So got some pushback from people on that. Um, Alf put up this tweet today, which is basically says, hey, look, you know, we had basically like a decade of most of the world economies struggling to grow, you know, uh, in any material way, certainly much less than they had in previous decades under uh, interest rates that were near 0%, right? So what's to make people think that they're going to be performing fine, you know, with, with a Fed funds rate somewhere between 4% or 5%, right? It just sort of stands to reason here that like, look, if they were if they were able to do anemic at best under the most generous interest rate policy in human history, you know, now that we've very quickly and very sharply raised the, the cost of capital here, you know, I think a thinking person says, you know, they should probably be struggling a lot more under this new regime. But for some reason, the markets are feeling pretty sanguine still here, Mike. So what do you think about all that? What's going to be proven I, right? I think, think I think I can't I can't I can't explain it. I can tell you I, I talk to many people every day and and we often uh commiserate about how how it doesn't make any sense it defies logic the markets are still floating up here at you know roughly 4200 41 4200 on the s p and um you can get five percent on a on a close to five percent on a six-month treasury bill 4.7 percent or something right now how can that be you know if the data is correct i think the data is correct we think the s p will have annual you know negative returns in, in the low single digits maybe minus two minus three percent at best is what you could expect from these valuations unless the fed can continue the magic forever why wouldn't you just take the five percent you can get on the treasury bill this doesn't make sense um you know in in grant i'm just looking at my notes here grant williams talked about onshoring and deglobalization you know that is happening. It's continuing to happen. That's going to guarantee higher costs, he says. I agree. And that's going to produce inflation. It's going to be inflation and, and a drag on growth. Yeah, exactly. And so that could dampen the Fed's pivot when it eventually happens. So I can, you know, I can understand that, you know, maybe the Fed's gone already too, already has gone too far. Maybe they should stop now. A lot of people criticize the Fed. You know, maybe they should stop tightening. That they're going to create an accident. You know, I, I would somewhat facetiously say that they really should have been out of the system the whole time. You know, so it's assuming that they can micromanage the economy and the markets. Um, that maybe they should step back and take a look. Your argument, they should see what happens and then maybe react later. But here's the problem: what if they can't micromanage things? They've been able to so far, at least with the one lever they have, print more money, the market goes up, print more money, the market goes up. Um, 
I don't know who's going to be proven right. I think that there's going to be a price to pay for the amount of uh, constant intervention that there's been. I think there's going to be some kind of financial accident that will surprise to the downside. That's what history shows us. Then I think we get the pivot. If I had to pick a side, that's what I think happens. And uh, I think they probably continue to tighten a little bit here uh, because they know that they need more leverage when that inevitably happens. So that would be my take. The big caveat is nobody knows for sure. We're all just speculating. Right. Although the market does agree with you in the sense that the odds for um, future rate hikes have gone up since the 6.4% CPI print came out. Um, all right. So I want to I want to end on a topic that Grant and I talked a bit about, um, which was this. As um, people get more pressed, right, uh, they become more like their 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 vision, their field of vision narrows and, and their focus goes down Maslow's hierarchy of needs. Right. And it, it switches from from speculative. OK, you know, how many gains could I get to just. I just want to protect what I have to, I just don't want to lose everything, right? Um, and as they begin to feel more and more threatened by um, volatility and uncertainty in the stock market, and right now we're getting a little bit of a reprieve from that. Um, but if we if we resume you know, a bearish trajectory here, that'll certainly stoke those fears again. Um, but you marry that with... Um, the decline in, in most households' biggest assets, right, which is their their the value of their home, right. We're seeing that the the housing market nationally has definitely rolled over, and certain uh, metros are getting really walloped right now. But the trajectory there for 2023 very clearly looks like it's it's highly likely to be to the downside. Um, and then you marry that with um, job instability, right, where people are beginning to see the hiring freezes the removal of benefits in a, in a growing number of industries, the layoffs coming, right? And so um, you, you begin to get that tunnel vision of just, hey, uh, my option set is shrinking. I'm not really worrying about all the fun stuff. I'm just really kind of focusing on survival right now. You guys talk to people all the time, right? That's what you guys do for a living as financial advisors, both your existing clients and people that are you know reaching out to you guys for help. Um, I'm just curious, are, are you seeing sort of a shift in tenor in the way that people are thinking right now? Are you beginning to see more of that type of tunnel vision? And um, and I guess maybe if you are, we could talk just very briefly about what are the types of conversations you can have with people who have those concerns, right? If somebody, if someone's watching their portfolio get a little shaky, if they're watching their home price coming down, if they're they're beginning to feel nervous about work, is there value you guys can provide to them as financial advisors to you know, to have a conversation to help them determine what planning they should be doing, given those concerns in their lives? I think we can bring perspective to to them. Um, we can we can give them some perspective that they may not be able to have on their own. They may be deep inside themselves or in their emotion. Uh, they may have some fear that we can help alle alleviate or, or, or conversely, they may not have enough, depending upon what their outlook is on things. Um, some recent conversations I had this week um, most of them were, were, were people that were looking at last year's results and they said, Hey, I'm down 20%. What's up with that? Uh, that doesn't feel right. I'm, I'm concerned. And Hey, just and to I be don't... clear, those weren't last year's results for your portfolio. No, right? my no. understanding is you guys were, were pretty flat for the year, which is great on a relative basis. So these are people who managing their money in some other way saying, I got burned. What do I do next? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, that's right. And, you know, the, the average loss might be 15 or 20 percent for people that are out there either doing it on their own or they're in some kind of managed program. But that's not a surprise. And that's not a knock on anyone in particular. The market, the S&P was down about 20 percent, uh, just under that, but close to 20 percent. So it's the first time in a long time. You might even say modern modern recent history, last 15 years or so, the first time that people really saw an annual result down like that. And it's like, hey, what's going on here? I thought markets only went up every year. It was okay if I'm up 10, 15, 20% every year. That's all I really ask for. Well, that's asking for too much because the only reason we've seen that is because we've had the biggest blow off top in our lifetimes due to printed money. And so then it's in inevitably going to correct. And so I said earlier in this conversation that this is based on the charts, the one of the biggest tops we've ever seen, probably the biggest top. 
And it's a rolling top of going on about 14 months now. And all that happened with last year's give back is we gave back most of the blow off top gains in 2021. If history is any guide, we're not even through the first phase of this bear market. We should see a move down towards the low 3000s, the 3200, which is a drop of over 20% or so from here. So without causing people to have more fear or panic, I am urging them or have been urging them this week and last week, take this big gain we've seen so far year to date as the bounce to readjust things if you're overexposed. And a lot of people are are very overexposed and they're having conversations with their advisors if they have one that are saying, you know, now's the time to either stay committed or increase on the pullback. That's what they're hearing. And we're saying decrease um, on, on the, on the bounce in the market, you know, um, they're seeing a pullback in their, their accounts. And, and like, uh, like I just said, other advisors are saying, well, you know, stay the course or add more money. We think that they should reduce exposure to stocks down to 30% or less versus the typical 60% or so. So we'll give them perspective to step outside themselves and say, you know what? I really made a ton of money. Like Grant Williams said in this, in this interview, people made a lot of money in the last 10 years. Okay. I gave back a little bit of it. Step back, realize where you are in life. Most people that we talk to are near retirement age or deep into retirement nail down some of those gains that you got and, and reduce risk. And we can help them do that with perspective. I think that's what we're, what we're doing best right now. All right. Yeah. And you know, when you're talking about people contacting you who are down 20% or whatever, you know, if, if that is somebody who is sort of later on in their life, you know, they're closer to the finish line of, in terms of how they're building their wealth, you know, that's a loss of a bunch of years that you just took off the table last year. Right. So um, obviously, mm -hmm. You know, what you guys really focus on is trying to help position people so that their odds of having that type of drawdown late in the game are much lower. Right. So. All right. Great. Um, so, you know, I really appreciate you sharing that answer, Mike. Um, one, just for the insights, but also to let people know that that there are people out there. You know, my, my wife's a therapist. Um, you know, I always encourage people, hey, you know, never hurts to. Um, Kind of have an impartial third party in the room to help you and your partner, you know, think through strategies of ways that you could, um, you know, manage your relationship better, right? There's just kind of no downside to doing that. Um, same thing on the financial side of things, right? You know, if you're if you're wrestling with some of these big questions, what do I do if I lose my job? Should we sell our house now or wait? You know, all that type of stuff. Um, it never hurts just to have a consultation with a smart financial advisor who can help sort of at least help you with the framing to figure out how to answer those questions. And as you said, Mike, you know, maybe sometimes add some context like, um, hey, you know, maybe you're a little bit too driven by your fear right now, or, you know, to your point, uh, hey, maybe you're being a little too magical thinking here and you need to, you know, start doing some, some uh, scenario planning just in case you're wrong, right? So anyways, uh, that's a good segue to wrap things up here, which is um, week after week, like I said, Grant did a much more eloquent job than I can do about making the argument for both uh, taking an active uh, management stance with your portfolio in this new environment, but also uh, finding a good advisor who has the ability to do that well, understands all the macro issues that Grant and you and I have been talking about here, Mike, put together a, a personalized portfolio plan for you and then manage it for you. If you're a regular person with a real life who doesn't have the ability to just be watching the markets every day, right? Which I think applies to almost everybody, you know, watching this video. So um, if you want to schedule one of those free consultations, just go to wealthion.com, fill out the short form there. Again, it doesn't cost you anything. There's no commitment to work with these guys. Uh, it's just a, a financial service that are endorsed financial advisors offer uh, to help people hopefully position themselves more smartly for what may lie ahead of us. And if you want, you can talk to Mike and his team there at New Harbor directly as well. Um, all right, then, folks. And then and wrapping up here real quick, I uh, just want to remind folks of two resources. Um, one is I've been getting a lot of uh, tweets uh, and emails and YouTube comments recently about folks saying, hey, Adam, what's that URL for the, the layoff survival guide that you've been talking about? Because I just lost my job. My spouse just lost their job. Etc. Boy, I wish I had read that sooner, but can you direct me to it? Uh, if, if you have not read that guide yet, folks, just go to wealthion.com slash layoffs. You can get it there for free. Um, it, it does have a bunch of steps you should take immediately if you do 
get surprised by a layoff, but it also has a bunch of advice in there that you should take before you get laid off to reduce the probability that, that you'd be one of the victims if your company does need to start cutting staff. Uh, and then last, I want to remind folks that our spring conference is coming up next month. We're about a month away from it right now. That's on Saturday, March 18th. And if you can't catch the live event, um, there will be replay videos that get sent for all the elements of the uh, conference, both the presentations and the live Q&A to everybody who registers. So don't worry if you can't watch live, you're going to get those videos. Uh, the speaker list is awesome and continues to grow. I won't rattle it off here because I've mentioned it on a bunch of the past videos. But to learn more about the event and to still lock in that lowest early bird price, just go to Wealthion.com slash conference. Um, all right. And if you enjoyed having Grant on this program, we'd like to see more great guests like him, as well as have Grant come back on here. Let's maybe say in Q2. Uh, do me a favor, support this channel by hitting the like button, then clicking on the red subscribe button below. Uh, Mike, another great week. Thanks for joining me. It was fun to have you on twice this week. Everybody else, thanks so much for watching. It's been a privilege to be here twice this week, Adam, and uh, I'll see you next week. Thanks a lot. If you'd like to schedule a consultation with one of the financial advisors at New Harbor Financial, simply go to Wealthion.com. These consultations are completely free and there are no strings attached. The good folks at New Harbor will simply answer any questions you have about your investment goals or your portfolio and give you their best advice given their latest market outlook. They're willing to do this because they care about protecting people's wealth and because Wealthion has connected them with so many thoughtful investors just like you over the past decade. We started doing this because so many people have approached us in frustration, looking for a solution because they're feeling out of alignment or downright ridiculed by the standard financial advisors who have been managing their money. You know the type. The kind that just pushes all of your money into the market, scoffs at the idea of owning gold, and when you bring up concerns about the market's sky-high valuations, they say, don't worry, the market will always take care of you. For many of the reasons discussed in today's video, we think this is one of the most challenging and treacherous times in history for investing. We strongly believe that today's investors are best served working in partnership with a conscientious professional financial advisor who understands the risks in play. Now, we're agnostic which professional advisor you work with, as long as they're good. If you're already working with one, that's fantastic. Stick with them. But if you don't, or are having trouble finding one you respect or trust, then consider talking to John and Mike and the team at New Harbor. Now, for those about to ask, yes, there's a business relationship between Wealthion and New Harbor, which we put in place to make sure everything is handled according to SEC regulations. All the details on this are clearly provided on the Wealthion.com website. Also, it's important to note that New Harbor is able to work with U.S. citizens, green card holders, and those with existing assets in the USA. But for regulatory reasons, they aren't able to take on non-U.S. clients. All right. With all that said, if you'd like some insight and guidance on how to protect your wealth during this unprecedented time in the markets, go to Wealthion.com to schedule your free consultation with the good folks at New Harbor. Thanks for watching.